Hello, Internet! My name's Patrick, and this is Fringeworthy, a show where I talk to you about weird magic decks. Today, we're talking about one of my favorite legacy decks of all time, Mono Blue Martyr. Now, I picked Mono Blue Martyr for a few reasons. Mostly being that it was the first legacy deck I ever built myself, and secondly, because there's no real good deck techs out there. Now, there have been some changes for the version I'll be talking about compared to Greg Hatch's original version a few years ago, but the main gameplay is the same. Now, let's get started. This is Greg Hatch's original, or as close as I could find, Mono Blue Martyr build. It's really great because it was a great read on the meta at the time. This deck absolutely demolishes Storm and other combo-based decks. The meta where I've been playing has shifted a little bit more towards a lot more creature-centric decks and some more tempo-related plays, so I've had to make some changes. Those changes look a little bit like this. First off, the biggest change is I've swapped out the Curse Catchers for Mausoleum Wanderers. I added two Ancestral Visions for extra card draw. I cut back on some of the Flusterstorms and Elementals in the combo because the combo is a little harder win against creature-based decks. I moved a sprite from the main board to the sideboard. I put the Gites in main board because I was running them every single time. We'll talk more about the sideboard changes when we get to the specific cards a little later. So, let's talk about the draw engines of the deck. First up, we've got Ninja of the Deep Hours and Ancestral Vision. Both of these are great ways for the deck to draw cards. Mono Blue Martyr is a very strange deck because almost every single trade we make is disadvantageous for us playing it. This means we're usually trading two of our cards for one of theirs. Now normally, this wouldn't work well for the deck. You'd end up getting out traded and the opponent would eventually win. We're able to keep up because we have powerful draw engines. The most powerful actually being Sky Hussar. It's impossible to cast Sky Hussar, but we can put it in with Aether Vial. Mostly we're using it for its forecast ability, which means free card draws every single turn. The next most important cards in the deck are of course our four copies of Force Spike, four copies of Force Spike, and four copies of Force Spike. Oh, oh wait, that doesn't look right. Ah, there we go. It's our four spikes on a stick. So we've got the four Mausoleum Wanderers, which are fancy curse catchers with flying, four Judges Familiars, which are actually curse catchers with flying, and the namesake of the deck, Martyr of Frost. Now, Mausoleum Wanderer and Judges Familiar don't hit creature spells, most importantly. They're just instants and sorceries. That's why this deck is super great against spell-based combo decks. Martyr of Frost is a real workhorse because of how much uncertainty it introduces for your opponent to play around. We could have a hand of about five or six cards, but how many of them are blue and how many of them are we willing to reveal? Not to mention, none of these creatures care whether they're tapped or untapped, so that means it's free-ish to draw the card with Sky Hussar every turn. Next up, we've got some support cards. We've got Aether Vials. We usually want to stick Aether Vial on one just to keep putting stuff in, and Scabaroonator to make use of all of these creatures that we're sacrificing to counter spells. We've also got some other counters in the way of spell stutter sprites, two in the main board, two in the sideboard, and four dazes. Basically, we want the cheapest counter spells possible. Speaking of which, we run four copies of Force of Will and four copies of Force of Will. Wait, oh, that's bad Force of Will. That's Disrupting Shoal. Disrupting Shoal is a great card in this deck, mostly because we run a ton of one drops, a good number of two drops, and even a couple three drops in the sideboard. And Disrupting Shoal is great for countering Force of Will by pitching a Sky Hussar to it. It's, it's a great play, really fun to make. Lastly, we've got this Niv Magus Flusterstorm combo. The idea of the deck is to spam out as many free spells as possible, then cast Flusterstorm and exile them all onto the Niv Magus Elemental. This makes the Niv Magus Elemental gigantic. There are times when I've been able to swing in with a 7-8, starting on turn two. So it's a very powerful combo, Against decks that don't have many spells, such as Eldrazi, we have to rely on countering our own spells to get the Flusterstorm count up high enough. This makes this a riskier strategy, so I've sort of scaled it back a bit just so that we can have more consistency with our other creatures. We also have some non-counter spell removal in the form of Snapback and Chain of Vapor, just to deal with some pesky permanents, and Umazawa's Jite. Most of these creatures, if we're not tapping them down to Sky Hussar, we can run them into the wall and let them die, and it's perfectly fine. It feeds the Scabarunator, puts charges on the Jite, and Jite can give minus one, minus one to enemy creatures, and take out some pesky small things like Deathrite Shaman and Flicker Wisp and Delvers. Really, really powerful card in the deck. And lastly, the mana base. We've got 12 islands, two wastelands. I run one more island than Greg Hatch did just because of consistency. Talking about the sideboard, again, we've got an extra Scabaroonator and two extra Spell Stutter sprites that are useful in a handful of matchups, but not in enough of them that we want the main board. We've got Tormar's Crypts to interact with graveyard decks and Pithing Needles to take care of pesky permanents. 
This category is what I call the Land Hosers. Back to Basics really shuts down on all sorts of decks that run a lot of non-basic lands. As you can tell, our only non-basic lands are Wastelands, and we only need to tap those once. Submerge is also something to board in against any deck that runs any kind of forest. Don't be afraid to cast a bunch of free submerges on your own Niv Magus Elemental and exile them to make him huge. Now the story behind Ivory Tower being in the deck, I heard from the original coverage of Greg Hatch playing this deck back in 2014, where he found it in his trunk and said, aha, that's the answer, and put it in his sideboard. No one's quite sure what the question is that Ivory Tower is answering, but most guesses are burn. This deck likes to hold a lot of cards in hand, and so Ivory Tower every turn can gain you 2 to 3 life. And the last and spiciest of the sideboard options is Teferi's Realm. Teferi's Realm is a very interesting card, which its text should just read, call a judge. The main use of this is twofold. One, it helps us beat Burn, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit, and it also gets around Chalice decks, which are one of the biggest problems that we have. Now, let's talk about some matchups. First matchup we want to talk about is Burn, like I said. Burn is a really rough deck because, as I was saying, they can be very fast. But the biggest thing that we have going for us is the Ivory Tower. We can Spell Stutter Sprite, bring those in from the board to counter more of their one-cost spells, and Teferi's Realm. With Teferi's Realm, we always want to name Enchantment. Teferi's Realm is the only enchantment we run, and if they've got Eidolon of the Great Revel out on our upkeep, we'll choose to phase out all enchantments, so we won't be affected by Eidolon's ability. On their upkeep, Teferi's Realm will still be phased out, and Eidolon will phase back in. They won't get a chance to choose something with Teferi's Realm to phase out. They'll have to deal with having the Eidolon of the Great Revel up on their turn, and we won't have to worry about it on our turn, because as you can tell, most of our spells cost less than three. Next up is Death and Taxes. Death and Taxes is one of the harder matchups for us, specifically because there's so many threats for us to try and counter, and only so many ways to counter them. Sanctum Prelate is a very, very good card if they play it and name one. Regardless, some of the biggest threats to watch out for are Stoneforge Mystic, Thalia, and Sword of Fire and Ice. Thalia is bad because the deck is built around playing free things, so making free things not free is bad. Next up we've got Miracles. Miracles is one of the better matchups for this deck. We can go toe to toe with them as it takes them longer to set up, get in some cheap easy damage, and hold back most of their expensive spells. Now the things to watch out for are Jace the Mind Sculptor and Entreat the Angels. Those ones we have limited counter spell options. Usually they'll come up late in the game where Daze doesn't do much and our Force Spikes on a Stick won't do much either, and our only hard counter options are our Forces. They're not reliably counterable by Disrupting Shoal. Now, Sensei's Divining Top is not a huge problem, counterbalance can be. For the board, we always want to pull in Pithing Needle, naming Top, and then a second one, maybe naming Jace the Mind Sculptor. Now, for Shardless Bug, this is a really rough match for us. There's a lot of value trades that they make that we just can't keep up with very well. We have to watch out for the Shardless Agent Cascades and the Baleful Strixes. Abrupt Decay is also a problem, and one of the reasons why I've been toying around with having Misdirection in the deck. So, if you end up running up against a lot of decks with Abrupt Decay, consider putting in Misdirection, or Divert, like Greg Hatch had in the sideboard of his original build. Other than that, just try to trade as well as you can with their creatures, and switch towards the Scab Ruinator kill of Sacrifice a lot of creatures to try and counter things, so you can play in a Scab Ruinator, since that will ruinate any of the creatures they're running, except Baleful Strix. You, you gotta deal with those with a GK or something. Show and Tell! Show and Tell's a combo deck. We do well against combo decks. Here are their combo pieces. Counter them. Sneak and Shell! Same sort of thing, except we bring in a Pithing Needle to deal with Sneak Attack. Eldrazi is one of the toughest matchups for us, with Thorn of Amethyst making things not free, Chalice of the Void on one, and Thought Not Seer being able to rip apart our hand. This is a very, very problematic matchup for us. They're very fast, it's hard to keep up with them, and we need to shift our game plan to be able to trade with them as much as possible. Being able to stabilize the board by turn 5 is a really hard ask against Eldrazi. Next up, we've got Aggro Loam. Aggro Loam is a really rough match for us game one, but in game two, we board in literally everything. Everything in the sideboard is good against something in Aggro Loam. Now, Delver is another fair matchup for us. We have to be careful to trade for the Delvers early, but for the most part, we want to lock them down with Back to Basics as best as we can, and hold up as many counters as possible until we can swing in for the win. Reanimator is a rough deck. We want to board in extra spell stutter sprites because they can usually hit most of their reanimation spells and counter as many reanimation spells as possible. Tormai's Crypt is also a good card against them. 
Aluren is a rough match for us. We want to make sure to counter any of their recruiters or Aluren itself, but we have a lot of good sideboard options. We can put in our back to basics, our submerge, and our pithing needle. That said, we do have to play the value trade game, and so that's why we've got Scab Ruinator being pulled in from the sideboard, as it can trade with anything in their deck except Baleful Strix. Elves is a rough matchup for us as well. It's a creature-based combo deck, which combo decks we should be good against, but not creature-based decks. We have to do what we can to counter the Heritage Druids, the Quirion Rangers, and the Wirewood Symbiotes, really the things that enable the strategy to combo out, get big mana, and get a Crater Hoof Behemoth, and Spell Stutter Sprites and Pithy Needles help with that. It's not a really great matchup for us, but we do what we can. Storm is the perfect matchup, however. Everything in the deck does great against Storm. So, don't worry about boarding anything, just be sure to try and counter their spells before they get more mana. So many of the counter spells that we have are taxing counters. We want to be able to cut them off at the Dark Ritual and Cabal Ritual level. Similarly, Oops All Spells is another perfect deck matchup for us. Everything it's trying to do, we have ways to stop very quickly. Dredge is a really bad matchup, because it relies so much on the graveyard, and our only graveyard hate is Tormont's Crypt. Well, that about wraps up this episode of Fringeworthy. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to leave a like below and subscribe for more episodes. Please also leave me a comment if you've got any other decks that you think are really great, but just don't have a good deck tech on. I'll do the research, figure out how to play them, and present them hopefully in a future episode. And end screen! This is an end screen. One of these is my face. The other is the last video. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Okay. That's enough of that.